This is episode 8 of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott A. J. Johnson. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. That's gorilla with two R's and two L's. To support this project and to get early access to all the chapters, head over to patreon.com slash shajjohnson. If you've gotten this far, I hope you're enjoying it, so take a minute to tell a friend. If you've already done that, please consider leaving this podcast a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you listen. And thanks. This podcast contains fleeting explicit language. Part 2, Chapter 16, 2, People, Social Structure. Our society uses a variety of systems to organize itself. Cities, neighborhoods, counties, and towns order us in physical space. Representatives in the local, regional, and national government make decisions and the rules by which we live. Our work is organized into industries, extraction, production, and service, also called the primary, secondary, and tertiary sectors of the economy, respectively. To keep track of resources and labor, we have devised a banking system. Through formal education, we learn how to navigate these systems and what role we are to play. The problem with each of these systems, however, is that they are built on an empty world model. Note, DALI, 1996. End of note which assumes infinite resources. Our world is not infinite, and we must dismantle the current system in order to create new ones based on reality. The current system ignores externalized costs, is predicated on selfish principles, functions as an oligarchy disguised as a democracy, and it exploits everything with which it comes into contact. We cannot simply update and improve the current system because it is built on a faulty foundation, or, in the words of Theodore Kaczynski, quote, People tend to assume that because a revolution involves a much greater change than reform does, it is more difficult to bring about than reform is. Actually, under certain circumstances, revolution is much easier than reform. The reason is that a revolutionary movement can inspire an intensity of commitment that a reform movement cannot inspire. A reform movement merely offers to solve a particular social problem. A revolutionary movement offers to solve all problems at one stroke and create a whole new world. It provides the kind of ideal for which people will take great risks and make great sacrifices. For this reason, it would be much easier to overthrow the whole technological system than to put effective, permanent restraints on the development or application of any one segment of technology. End of quote. Note. Kaczynski, 2008, page 81. End of note. End of chapter. Chapter 17. Government Moles. Fall, 2015. I just can't believe it, said Colleen, a senior official with the Centers for Disease Control, Chicago office. I was pretty surprised to find out, too, Lauren said. I immediately thought of you and our lunch conversations back when I was interning here. A few weeks earlier, Lauren had gotten in touch with Colleen, asking if she would be free for coffee on Lauren's next visit up to Chicago. Lauren leaned in closer to Colleen. Do you still feel the same way about the way our society is headed? Colleen sighed and leaned back, running her hand through her short, graying blonde hair. She fished in her purse, pulling out a cell phone. Lauren's heart started to pound, but her face remained calm. She let out the breath she didn't realize she had been holding when a phone gave a beep as it shut down. Is yours off? Colleen asked. Yes, of course. I didn't even bring it. Why not pop your battery out? Oh, right. Colleen field stripped her phone. If I'm being honest, yes, I feel the same way as I did years ago, but now I have even more experience and evidence to back it up. Hell in a handbasket doesn't even start to cover it. I feel the same way. So when I found out about this group and their plans, I thought I would get in contact with you first before I decided what to do. Are you thinking of turning them in? I mean, Lauren took a deep breath, readying herself to lie. They're not my clients, so I can't claim attorney-client privilege. If it came out that I knew and said nothing, I could get disbarred. But, but I can't help but hope that they go through with it. If even half of what I heard is true, it's going to be a nationwide emergency. Uh Aha, now I see. You didn't just come to me because of my antipathy towards modern society. You came to me because I'm one of the CDC's chief disaster officers. Right, so what do you think? Well... Let me think for a second. And remember, this is strictly hypothetical. Colleen glanced around the busy coffee shop and out into the street. She took a few sips of coffee while she thought. Do you know how close they are to this? When is it supposed to happen? No, she lied again. If we're lucky, when would they do it? Well, a spring or fall would be better because we wouldn't be dealing with heating or cooling. Spring might be good because we'd have the whole summer to prepare. But then again, food stores are lowest in the spring, so maybe the fall would be best. Assuming everybody stocked up for the winter. Good luck with that. I saw an article, backed up by my own anecdotal observations, that plenty of people my age don't bother keeping much more than snack food on hand since they eat out for most meals. I'd believe it. Food distribution is right after safety, water, and shelter in our priorities. If everybody had canned goods and dry, non-perishables stored up, it would really ease the pressure on the response system. What about the CERT network? Well, I suppose it would be activated, and it is something, but if I understand your description correctly, these folks are targeting infrastructure, not people, so most of their training wouldn't be helpful. 
They concentrate on medical and fire emergencies as well as disaster preparedness. You know, for hurricanes, tornadoes, and earthquakes. It wasn't designed for long-term logistics. What if the government stockpiled emergency supplies throughout the country? That's also unlikely. We got rid of our strategic grain reserve starting in the 1980s under Reagan. We sold the last of our grain, converting the Bill Emerson Humanitarian Trust into an all-cash reserve in 2008 under Bush. The logic ran that because grain didn't collect interest while sitting in silos, it was better to sell it, invest the money, and then in a time of crisis, use that money to buy food. That seems... stupid? Yeah, it is. Any chance we'd bring it back? Short of an existential crisis? Wait, let me rephrase that since climate change is that threat, and in our hypothetical scenario, this group would be an existential problem as well. Short of a crisis recognized by the bigwigs in Washington as an existential threat? No. I see zero chance that they'd reinstate this reserve. Petroleum? Yes. Medicine and medical supplies? Also yes. Food? Not so much. Wait, medical supplies? Yeah. The Strategic National Stockpile has a dozen nondescript guarded warehouses across the country. Each one contains medical supplies ready to go out on short notice. We deploy aid after natural disasters, terrorist attacks, or any other scenario where public health could become a major concern. We've got vaccines, antibiotics, and other equipment ready to bolster the local healthcare infrastructure. I've never heard of that. Any other obscure national stockpiles? Hmm, let me think. Uh, the Supreme Court ordered the Strategic Raisin Reserve unconstitutional in 2015. Seriously? Yep. We've still got a helium reserve, though. Oh, and gold in Fort Knox. Fat lot of good either of those will do. So if the government is incapable of creating strategic reserves, does it fall to the states? I think the best model is really the Mormons. The Mormon church has a stockpile? I don't know about that, but I do know that many Mormon families have personal stockpiles of six months to a year's worth of food and supplies. I hesitate to ask, but are they all preppers? What's the basis? I think they are inspired more by mundane reasons than the preppers, like illness, loss of income, or other normal problems. The logic is that if you have food stored up when you have the ability to do so, you'll have less to worry about when the unexpected happens. Well, that makes sense. Any chance we could get the public at large to be that proactive? Colleen laughed until tears came to her eyes. The other patrons of the coffee shop cast wary glances at her. That's a no? asked Lauren as Colleen dried her eyes. We can't get the public to do anything. Half the population either can't afford to put up a month's worth of food or doesn't have the space to store it efficiently. The other half can't be bothered. What about the zombie contest? The one that tried to get people prepared for disasters? Well, that was one of our biggest successes, of course. Did you hear how much that cost? Lauren shook her head. $87. What? That's it? Yeah, we just put up a blog and the media took it from there. Did people actually make emergency preparedness kits based on your fake zombie apocalypse warnings? The only study I saw was flawed. It was run by some communications researchers. Note. Faustino and Ma, 2015. End of note. They took two samples of people. Those exposed to humorous preparedness messages and those exposed to serious versions of the same info. Those who got the funny one were less likely to get a kit, make a plan, or what have you. Here's the flaw, though. Way more people saw the humorous message because it was so widespread. Thus, the net number of people getting kits or making a plan was higher than other traditional boring messages. They just compared the people exposed to the messages, forgetting to account for the total number of people who would see one or the other. Of course, a serious message is more likely to get a response, but only a few people bother to read the serious stuff. Ah, so, uh, let's say, 5% success rate for 100 people seeing the message is half as effective as a 1% success rate for a 1,000 people seeing a funny message in total. Right, and since it boosted our page views from 80 an hour to over 60,000 at its peak, as well as tripling our per-month blog page views over the long run, I'd say that reaching more people with humor is a net positive. I don't know if we could swim against the tide, though. Even if we had a successful campaign, we'd be talking about people shelling out thousands of dollars to stockpile food. I mean, we have a huge garden and we still spend 50 to to $100 a week buying groceries for two. A year's worth of flour, sugar, oil, beans, and so on would be a strain on the budget. Not to mention our current food system. We couldn't support everyone buying a year's worth of food in a short period. I think we could work out a strategy, though. Since we just need to make it through the winter and spring, I'd say six months would be plenty. On top of that, people would be buying non-perishable foods in bulk, which is usually cheaper. If people bought a little bit extra each week for a few months, they could build up a reserve. It'd be doable, but people would have to be motivated. More than just a social media campaign? Right. Social media would have to be part of it, of course, but it has to be on the, a national program. Maybe couch it in patriotism and self-sufficiency to bring some folks in. You know, the rugged individualists. Others would respond to calls for community and family. Would it be effective to create neighborhood stockpiles, asked Lauren. 
Probably in cities, folks in the country often have more food on hand as it is. We have an existing stockpile and distribution infrastructure in cities through food pantries. If we could bolster their capacity, it might be a start. But again, this is all hypothetical. Right, sure. But would it hurt if the nation got more food secure, though? No, no, of course not. It'd make responding to disasters easier if we didn't have to worry about feeding people. I'm the wrong person to ask, since disaster preparedness is my job. It's like asking a coal miner if coal power is good. Fair enough. You said the zombie apocalypse things cost $87? Colleen nodded. Maybe we could get this conversation started with something similar. Any ideas? Not yet, but I might have some friends who do. What kind of friends? Asked Colleen, giving Lauren a sideways glance. The not-hypothetical kind? End of chapter. Chapter 18. 2.1. Social Organization. 2.1.1. Physical Organization. Cities have only existed for about 7,000 years, and they have always been a drain on their surroundings. Until only a few hundred years ago, cities could not maintain their populations through local reproduction. Disease was so prevalent that urban death rates exceeded that of births. It was only because people from the country moved into cities that they grew. Even today, no city is self-sustaining in any sense of the word. Vast amounts of electricity, fossil fuels, food, materials, and wealth must be dumped into the gaping maw of each metropolitan area. These resources are used and discarded, overflowing landfills and clogging waterways with effluent. That is not to say cities are all bad. Cities use less gasoline, electrical cable, and road surface per capita than one might expect. Cities have higher wages and more patent holders, inventors, and wealth than the countryside. Cities are dominated by the manufacturing and service industries, while the acquisition of raw materials takes place in their surrounding region. For all that, cities also have higher crime rates and no better employment numbers, electrical use, or water consumption than the country. The biggest problem to sustaining a large city is transportation. When fossil fuels run out, it will be difficult to move the tons of fresh food and other products needed to sustain the dense populations. Cities violate all of our precepts. Cities only accept species deemed to be beneficial or at least benign. Each year, for example, people in Florida's cities are appalled when alligators show up in their backyard as if the reptiles were intruders. Dogs, cats, songbirds, squirrels, and other cute and cuddly animals are welcomed, while rats and insects are eradicated. Cities do not mimic nature. Some animals live in large, dense, city-like communities, such as ants, termites, and bees, but they do not increase past a certain size. Most species of bees, for example, will divide their hive when it reaches about one and a half cubic feet in size. Even ant supercolonies, consisting of hundreds of millions of ants, are subdivided into nests of a few hundred thousand ants apiece. Humans, though, insist on making ever larger and more populated cities instead of taking the hint from other gregarious species. Large cities are complicated organic constructions, and the ad hoc nature of their maintenance puts them in a precarious position when resources falter and change. Indeed, research shows that humans have cognitive limits on the number of meaningful relationships they can manage. Note. Dunbar, 1992. End of note. Cities are no longer human-scaled, and they must be reined in. Cities were once chosen with their natural environments in mind. Today, we modify the environment to suit our wishes instead. Cities should be limited by a few common-sense rules derived from other species that have learned to live successfully in large communities. First, each city must have a population maximum, and the limit should be determined by the city's catchment area. A catchment area will support its population by providing enough food, water, building materials, and space. Some areas will support greater populations than others. Coasts are ecologically rich, and more people can live on the resources available near the coast than in high mountains, for example. We'll discuss population growth below, section 2.3, but currently the United States has about 7 acres per person. Ecologically diverse and rich areas may support people on as few as 3 or 4 acres per person, while other areas might need 7 to 10 acres per person. Communities should be defined within geographical areas, a watershed, around a lake, along a river, a valley, etc., For some communities, it makes sense to live together densely, leaving the rest of the catchment area open for careful use. In other areas, people may prefer to spread out evenly across their territory. In all, though, communities should average about 100 square miles and have less than 10,000 people, which is about 6.4 acres per person. At this scale, one could cross the entire catchment area in less than an hour by bicycle. More importantly, people would know one another again. And as most of the resources for a community would have to come from their own territory, residents would have a vested interest in maintaining the ecological health of their surroundings. End of chapter. End of episode 8 of Eco Gorillas. For more, visit ecogorillas.com.